Okay, so uh, today we are going to talk about quasi Newton's method. Oh, not Newton's, just Newton. Quasi Newton method. So, what's the background? Uh, the background is we learned about gradient descent. xk plus 1 equals xk minus alpha k dk gradient of the function f at xk. Uh, we also learn steepest descent is slow, Newton's method is fast. Right, and we learned some variation of Newton's method for least square problem. Okay, so this is what we have done so far. Yes. When you say slow and fast, there you mean the computation being not step one. Well, number of iterations. What I mean is in Newton's method, the number of iterations is low. You get to, you converge to the solution faster, but certainly when your x is very large, then the computation time kicks in and sometimes you have to make the trade off. Okay, so by slow, I mean you have to take far more number of iterations with steepest descent. You have to take fewer iterations with Newton's method. And we studied a variation of Newton's method called Gauss-Newton method for least square problem. Okay, so today we are going to talk about a quasi-Newton method, which essentially, uh, which essentially tries to compute dk in an iterative fashion, which best approximates the second derivative of the function. Okay, so or the inverse of the second derivative of the function. So that's what the goal for today's class is going to be. Okay, so xk plus alpha k dk, okay, and I'm going to define my pk to be xk plus 1 minus xk. I will define qk to be gradient of fxk plus 1 minus gradient of f at xk. Okay, so these are the two new notation we will be using in this particular class. Yes. When you say a, as a fact variation of Newton's method for least square, we're not actually stating anything, or are you just saying we've covered it already? We have covered it already. Okay. This is what we have done in the class. I mean, besides many other things. Okay, and the third, and, and quasi-Newton method will be of similar, it will be in similar spirit as the variation of Newton's method that we studied, okay? So in the variation, in the Gauss-Newton method, we just dropped one term because we thought it will not affect the solution too much, okay? Because the curvature of the function would be low. So in that case, Gauss-Newton's method would make sense. It's computationally faster. We don't need to compute the second derivative, okay? So the benefit for that was that it inherits some of the properties of Newton's method, which is that it converges fast um, in, terms of the number of iterations it takes. And now the idea is to come up with a similar technique for a general problem. Not a similar technique actually, it's uh, slightly different, but uh, it's along the same spirit. Now, going back to this particular equation, we can 
ride from Taylor series. If PK is small, that is XK plus 1 is close to XK, then QK is almost equal to the second derivative at XK plus 1 multiplied by PK. Okay. So assuming that these alpha k's are small and dk's are not very large, xk plus 1 will be close to xk and so this expression would be approximately correct and so what I can do is <coughs> idea 0, if I want to estimate the second derivative, I can do qk minus n QK, I can stack them as a matrix, it will be almost equal to second derivative of the function multiplied by PK minus N PK. Okay, so somehow run for k iterations, assume that you got linearly independent set of updates in, these, uh, in this case. And now if you want to compute the second derivative, the idea is simple. I can just take the matrix on this side and so I have PK inverse. Okay, of course we are assuming that this is invertible and if you are moving in different different directions then this would be invertible and this is my idea zero, a very rough idea. Yes. Normally we have N as greater than K and if that uh, approach approach because we normally have n is what uh, it, it's in or n for it should be n minus k not k minus n no what? so n is the dimension of x typically this k is going to infinity because you're running this iteration for a very very long time okay so, we're assuming okay. so yeah k is greater than n so k is greater than n okay uh, you're running it for many, many iterations. And so this gives you an idea of second derivative of the function, okay? So now, the, 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 the good thing here is I don't have to compute the second derivative as long as these directions are linearly independent, the matrix is invertible. I can multiply it to the gradient, the difference of gradient matrices, matrix, and I can get an idea of, a rough idea of, or a rough estimate of the second derivative of the function at xk plus one. I can keep updating this, these matrices, do the inverse, take the inverse of this whole thing, and I can get the uh, second derivative inverse. I can plug it in here, and I can run the algorithm, okay? But now the problem is, again, we have to take the inverse of a matrix, and that could be difficult or time consuming or could take a lot of computational time on the machine. And we want to avoid that problem. We want to be able to update dk uh, with least number of calculation. Okay, so how do we do that? What are your thoughts? So this is idea zero, okay, a rough idea. Maybe you were sitting in your office in 1950s and then you had this idea that look, for some reason, I cannot compute the second derivative of the function, but I can use PK and QK, which is something that I have to compute. I can use these two, uh, these two vectors, stack them together, do some matrix manipulation, and I can get an approximation. So what is the new idea? Well, question first. 
first from the statement of xk plus 1 equals holds xk plus alpha k dk, mm -hmm. uh, we can say that uh, uh, pk uh, equals alpha k dk, where are we getting the information ahead of time to calculate a, um, a del squared f, f if we're going to use that to calculate either alpha or dk? Uh, there's some cyclical information going on there, isn't there? No. So all I'm saying is qk minus 1 is roughly equal to xk plus 1, pk minus 1, and so on. So as long as all these n iterates are uh, in, in close proximity with each other, these relationship would hold. OK, so you're, you're assuming you already have the space to build from. Yeah. OK. OK. Uh, OK, so what would be idea number one? So idea number one, I think late 1950s, so I'll just write 1959, but I may be wrong by a little bit. So the idea was that, let me call this as BK plus one. Uh, so I'm going to define BK plus one as second derivative defined at xk plus 1. So from this particular expression, I have that qk equals bk plus 1 multiplied by pk. OK. What else do we know about this matrix BK plus 1? So we also know that BK plus 1 is BK plus 1 transpose, which is symmetric. Because its second derivative, it is symmetric. Okay. Yes. If we're going to assume that it's invertible for the work we were going to want to do with it later on, and we can assume that it's going to be greater than zero, then yes. the eigenvalues yes. and make it positive. Definitely. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, we'll get to it in a bit. Okay. So, any more? Uh, so, so any idea that you might want to explore? So we know that the matrix BK plus 1 satisfies this expression. And BK plus 1 satisfies this expression, that is, it is symmetric. Okay, So it's not just some arbitrary matrix. It has to be symmetric because it's a second derivative or an approximation to a second derivative. So the idea that came around in 1959 was, let me define my BK plus 1 as a matrix that is close to BK and satisfies these two conditions. So BPK equals QK and B equals B transpose. This minimization is over all possible B, all possible matrices B. And this is any matrix, any reasonable matrix norm that you can think of. Okay, so this gives you a very wide range of possibilities because you can take L1 norm, whatever, matrix norm with norm 1, and then you will get one expression for BK. If you take norm 2, you get some expression for BK, BK plus 1. If you take norm infinity, you get some other expression for BK plus 1. Isn't that the argument? Because if we're just saying... Oh, it's yeah, it's argument. Infinity. Yeah. Okay. Argument. Okay. So that's the first idea. And and what the authors consider is a very specific norm here, which sort of simplifies this whole thing. 
So let me tell you what that norm is. So the norm I'm going to consider is dk comma 2. So remember dk is bk inverse. And the norm that I'm going to define is q raised to half a q raised to half 2 norm. Okay, so this is how I'm going to define this norm. So I pick the positive definite matrix dk and I take the two norm of a matrix that looks something like this. Okay, and once you solve this problem, you actually get the matrix in closed form, which is given by the following expression. So you have dk plus 1, which would be bk plus 1 inverse. So dk plus 1 is given by dk minus It's a pretty long expression, so bear with me. Okay, so what's the benefit of this expression? Okay, just matrix multiplication and matrix addition. No funky inverse, no nothing, just some updates by two rank one matrices. So how involved is the process to actually get that answer? I don't know. I picked it up from the book. Uh, but you might have to go to the original paper to see how difficult it is to get this answer. So two norm is easy to understand, right? Uh, this would be just the norm of each of the two norm of each of the rows, mm -hmm. right? Square. Let's just do square because that that's easy. And then what you get is linear constraints, linear constraints and then a quadratic function. So probably it's going to be much very easy to derive this expression. Okay. But it's going to be cumbersome, it's not going to be straightforward, okay? So it's a quadratic cost function with linear constraints and linear constraints. So probably it's an easy problem to solve. So this is the update equation it's all matrix multiplication, very easy to do operation. This is a rank one matrix. This is another rank one matrix. So at every point of time, you're making rank two updates to dk, which is the inverse of the second derivative or an approximation to the inverse of the second derivative. Okay, and this method is known as DFP method. And DFP stands for? Let me, DFP stands for Davidon, Fletcher, and Powell. Okay. Davidon, Fletcher, and Powell's method. So it became, uh, it was introduced in somewhere around 1959 and then it became common to use this method in 1960s. Okay, so again, let's go back. I have pk, I have the information about pk which is the difference in x case, 
I have information about QK, which is the difference in the gradients. I want to come up with DK plus 1. And I don't want to do a lot of computation. I want to do as minimal number of computation as I can. And I know that based on the previous uh, differences and based on the previous iterates, I can find an approximation to the second derivative. But this requires some sort of matrix inverse. So it's somewhat complicated. I don't like that. So I need to come up with a more clever idea of coming up with dk plus 1. So a more clever idea is to turn one optimization problem into a more complicated optimization problem. But you can solve this optimization problem very easily. Okay? And you formulate an optimization pro problem over the class of, over the space of symmetric matrices that satisfies this constraint, because this is the minimal constraint you want the second derivative to satisfy. You can put more constraints, but that's not going to make your life easier. It's only going to make your life worse. So you just want minimal number of constraints. And then, lo and behold, you get a closed form expression for the update of dk plus 1, which requires dk, qk, and pk. And it requires basic matrix operations to do. OK? so. Uh, Computationally very cheap, you can get dk plus 1. Now, under certain conditions, you can guarantee that if dk is positive definite, then dk plus 1 is also positive definite. So how do we start out with this method? Because I, I assume we can get uh, the original the d1 through the normal process. but that D1, you point. can pick identity or whatever. But at what point do we have enough information to use this approach? Does it work? as soon as we have d1 and we can use this for d2? Yes. Okay. Yes. You can, so you start with identity, and then you have these rank 2 updates, and then whatever you get, you can keep running this again and again. And you can guarantee that if dk is positive definite, then under certain reasonable conditions, dk plus 1 is also positive definite. So you always remain within the class of positive definite matrices. Now remember that here, you're looking at symmetric matrices, OK? But uh, under very reasonable restrictions, you can actually get positive definite. So you don't go out of the space of positive definite matrices. So this is your ma symmetric matrix. And then there is this positive definite matrix, Right? And if you start from inside, then you remain within this set of positive definite matrices. You don't go out of it. So that's really pretty cool here. OK? Now, the second thing that you want to note is that this particular update equation comes from a very specific norm. You can change the norm. And you can come up with a very different expression for the update equation for dk. And even that would be called a quasi-Newton method. Okay, But uh, this one is much, much easier to implement. And that's why this became famous. Any question? Yes? Uh, does changing it to a different type of norm provide it any significant additional value? or? At least not in the books that I've read so far. Okay. So if you're trying to improve the approach, you're looking down the road. Okay. So let's look at the second idea, idea number two. Sorry, professor. Yes. For that method, you had to compute dk to the half, right? Yes. Is that easy? That is very easy, yeah. Uh, well, OK. So easy in what way? We never actually have to compute dk raised to half in order to do this update. Oh, I see. Okay. It's just an analytical vehicle. It's not really something you need to compute. Good question. OK. 
Now idea number two, which probably came around the same point, 1960s. So all I'm going to do is rewrite this particular expression. So I'm going to write pk equals dk plus one qk, right? Because dk is bk inverse. And then I'm going to rewrite this particular optimization problem as dk plus one equals argmin over d norm of d minus dk, and which norm I should take, bk comma two, dqk equals pk, d equals d transpose. Let me put a square there. Okay, and again you can solve this complicated optimization problem analytically and you get the expression dk plus 1 equals identity minus And this is known as uh, BFGS method. Okay. BFGS method is considered more superior than uh, DFP method, and and people tend to implement BFGS methods more often than any other method. Uh, it has, uh, it converges, in practice it just converges much faster than DFP method, okay? In terms of computational time, not, but not much difference. Okay, yes? Do you mean computational time per step or computational time overall? Per oh, step. Okay. But certainly overall also BFGS method uh, is much faster than DFP, even though computational time for each step is much lower. So that's the idea of, Listen. yes. How exactly do we go about solving that optimization problem? So what's the function that we're taking here? So is it D minus, I guess in that case, See, this is a quadratic cost function right. with linear constraints. Uh -huh. So it's not very difficult to solve, but, the, but I haven't read the original proof in the paper because it's not there in the book. Okay. 
And it's not there in the other books that I've consulted for this particular lecture. Now, uh, but, but, but I, my thinking is that since this is a quadratic cost with linear constraints, it would be much easier to actually uh, solve this problem. Okay. Um, yeah. So based on these two methods, now one can come up. Yeah. Uh, is it PK transpose or QK in second order? This is PK QK transpose, and this is PK transpose QK. Okay. So this is a scalar. The denominator is is a scalar, and the numerator is a rank one matrix. Okay, this is a rank one matrix. And this is the identity matrix. So you subtract a rank one matrix from an identity matrix on both the sides and you multiply it by DK. You know what I'm thinking? I don't know whether there, ha there is a transpose here or not. Because this doesn't look like a symmetric matrix. So maybe there is a transpose here, which I forgot to note down on my notes. But I'll check it and I'll send you an email. Now, based on these two methods, now you can come up with a, so this gives you one value of dk, this gives you another value of dk. You can take a convex combination of these two DKs and you can come up with a new DK. So there is a question. Where? Here? But that would be that that's there in the denominator. That would be a scalar. which is the transpose of this, right? So this is identity transpose is identity and PK, QK transpose transpose is QK, PK transpose, yeah. Okay, so now I could come up with some I can put CK in 0, 1, and I can define my DK plus 1 as DK plus 1 DFP multiplied by CK plus 1 minus CK. And this collectively is quasi-Newton method. Okay. Of course, you can have multiple other variations of quasi-Newton method as well, but uh, you could take a convex combination of these two positive definite matrices, and then you can use that to update your DK plus 1. You have a question? Yeah. yeah. In what cases would we want to use that approach of, of combining them both? Because then we have to compute them both. So where is it useful enough for us to use so, that approach? Okay. So you don't really, you don't have to compute both of them because some of the terms are similar here. Mm -hmm. So in the book, there is a long expression, which is a rank three expression given which uh, combines the two approaches into a one long equation okay um, see in optimization sometimes it's better to do some of these analytical things by hand and then implement it rather than asking the computers to do separate things and then combine them together 
So what's the benefit of this? So the first thing is DK is positive definite. Alpha K chosen such that Yes. Should that be dk plus 1 after the... Uh, uh, this update. Well, so in, in the less than statement, shouldn't it be dk plus 1 at the very end of the line? Because we're saying... No, this is just dk. So you have to pick alpha k, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this is xk plus alpha k dk. So you just want to pick a value of alpha k such that this inequality is satisfied. Okay. You, you don't quite know dk plus 1 until you computed xk plus 1. Right? So in fact, uh, dk plus 1 requires capital dk plus 1. So dk plus 1 is minus dk plus 1 gradient of fxk plus 1. Okay, so as long as your alpha k is uh, sufficiently small or large and that condition is satisfied, you are guaranteed that dk plus 1 uh, computed this way is going to be positive definite. So you never actually leave the set of positive definite matrices as long as you start within the set of positive definite matrices. Now there are many variations of this particular uh, algorithm which we will not cover in this class but I want to uh, let you guys know about it just in case if it's needed for your research. So this method is good as long as your, uh, as long as these updates make sense in the sense that uh, make, making these updates, so how many updates are these? These are n square updates in your computer, in your RAM, right? This is your n square updates in your RAM. Uh, sometimes these, so if your matrix is 1000 cross 1000, probably not a big, big deal. But if your matrices are million cross million, then it's a big deal. So one of the ongoing research is to understand how to extend this uh, uh, quasi-Newton method to very large scale optimization problems. And the idea there is you want to make sure that your matrix D is sparse. What does sparsity mean in terms of a matrix? So most of the elements are zero and some of them is non-zero. Okay? So at least the diagonal entries have to be non-zero because uh, it's a positive definite matrix. But then rest of the entries in the matrix should be, <coughs> should be, uh, so most of the entries should be zero, some of the entries should be non-zero, okay? So how would you come up with a sparse update scheme for uh, D so that the number of, uh, number of updates should be less than, much, much less than N square? especially when n is a uh, million. So that's something that people have looked at in the past. There are some algorithms uh, and uh, this is still an ongoing area of research. 
okay especially some of these people are still around and they are still working on these problems and um, and you can go and look at their papers uh, on these large scale quasi newton method okay so a lot of structure can be put so for instance you could have dk which is block diagonal okay so everything is zero except for something around the diagonal elements so you could have block diagonal structure you could have sparse structure or you could have some more structure depending upon the problem at hand and then you can uh, uh, you can make as few updates to dk as possible while guaranteeing positive definiteness and and then you can apply quasi newton method uh, and then I, I don't quite know what are the research topics what people have explored already so that's something you could investigate if you uh, if this method is something that suits your personality okay that concludes quasi newton method any question so far question no okay so far we uh, we have talked about gradient descent for unconstrained optimization problems so your set is rn you can go in any direction you want there is no boundary and the idea was that look if gradients or if the descent direction satisfy gradient related property then you will converge to a stationary point then you have to check the sufficient condition if everything looks good then you are at a local optimal if things don't look good if the second derivative is not positive semi definite or positive definite then you cannot really certify whether it's a uh, whether it's a local minimum or not now what happens when you have a boundary okay uh, then your dk cannot be arbitrary you cannot just go anywhere your step size cannot be anything right it has to be chosen such that you remain within the set uh, that is that is studied under the topic of constrained optimization which is our next topic okay so i am looking at problems where i want to minimize fx such that x is in capital set x for the purpose of next few classes i am going to assume that x is a subset of rn and it's a convex subset convex subset and it should be non empty and f should be differentiable or f x to r is differentiable okay so now here is the picture i have some function and i have some constraint set above which this function is defined and i start with some point x not and i want to find a path to get to x star so the goal in the subsequent lectures is going to be
how do we specialize the gradient descent algorithm to a convex set? And the key issue or the key challenge is that your xk plus alpha k dk may not be in the capital set X. Okay, so you come up with a descent direction dk, let's say you came up, your dk was negative of gradient of fxk, but then it's not, it doesn't uh, really, so for every value of alpha k greater than zero, this thing is outside the set. Let's say you are at the boundary. You are here, this is your xk, and this is your gradient of f at xk, or rather negative of gradient of fxk. Okay, so no, so there's, there's just no way to move, right? Because as soon as you move out, I mean, as soon as you move in this direction, you go out of the set. Okay, so that's what we are going to study. The first thing that we need to know is what's the necessary conditions for optimality. So, necessary conditions. So, x star is local. If x star is a local minimum, then Gradient of f at x star transpose x minus x star is greater than or equal to zero for all x in capital set X. So let's say I have a circle. Someone claims that this is the optimal point, x star. So what I have to do is I have to compute the gradient of the function at x star. Okay, I have to pick any other x within the set, okay? and then look at this x minus x star. This is x minus x star, vector x minus x star. So x minus x star and the gradient makes an angle less than 90 degrees, okay? Then x star is optimal. That's what this means, okay? So the if A transpose B is greater than or equal to zero, it means that the angle between the vectors A and B is less than 90 degrees. So in this particular figure, the gradient of fx star is pointing inwards, perhaps towards the center of the sphere. And so no matter which x you take, right, this is going to make an angle less than or equal to 90 degrees with the gradient and therefore x star is a candidate for optimal solution. Why a candidate? Because it's only a necessary condition for optimality. If f is convex, then this is also sufficient, okay? But without convexity, that's only a necessary condition for optimality, so this is a candidate local minimum. Let's look at another example. Okay. And this is, someone claims that this is the optimal point. And I look at the gradient of the function at that particular point. And no matter which, which vector I take, it always makes a angle less than or equal to 90 degrees. And therefore, this, is, this satisfies the necessary conditions for optimality. Okay, does that make sense?
So I will pr cover the proof in the next class. For the convex case, why this is sufficient should be easy to show. And the reason is, so if f is convex, then f of x is greater than or equal to f of x star plus x minus x star gradient of f at x star, right? That's the property of convex set by the property of uh, uh, convex function. And, and so if fx is greater than or equal to fx star, then this implies that this must be greater than or equal to 0. Okay. So that proves the sufficiency part, which is if f is convex, then this is sufficient. Let me write it a uh, fact. If f is convex, then nc is sufficient. So in the next class, what we are going to do is we will look at the proof of this particular uh, necessary condition. And then we will also study some examples why constrained optimizations are, why constrained optimization is useful in practice. Typically the constraints would come from a physical system or a physical quantity that gets preserved. And therefore, uh, one has to optimize, one has to optimize the overall function within those physical constraints imposed by the system that you are looking at. Okay, so we'll meet in the next class. Thank you for your attention.